He said he would never be able to read. That's what the doctor told me as I began to sink in the overstuffed sofa in his office. I looked down at my baby boy who wasn't paying any attention to us. He was too busy perfectly aligning Lego pieces on the shag carpet. That sensation of drowning continued and actually intensified as the verbal blows continued. He won't really ever understand emotion. He'll have a hard time making friends. He'll be the perfect victim for bullies. The doctor droned on and on with these unbelievably negative predictions about my son. And he finished it up with a short sentence, your son has autism. I don't remember much about the rest of that day. I don't remember driving home. I don't remember eating dinner. And actually, the weeks and months that followed are kind of a blur. But you know what's not a blur? The horrible emotions. I still felt like I was drowning. Drowning in grief, anger, and utter hopelessness. I had this gnawing feeling and fear of what the future held for my son. My husband and I were also in mourning. We were mourning the death of the child we thought we had. <sighs> um, but if I'm to be completely honest, a lot of those emotions were about me and a lot of self-pity because Zane was the exact same little boy who walked out of that doctor's office that day. I had changed my view of him so much, but it wasn't a death. The diagnosis of autism can be very lonely and isolating. That situation does a really good job of separating you from people. The irony is that if you are an individual or a family dealing with autism, you're far from alone. The stats are staggering. In the 60s and 70s, one person out of 2,000 was diagnosed with autism. In 2014, the CDC identified one out of 68 children, and no one knows why it's increased so much. It's really a lot to think about and take in. The hallmark features of autism are complications with communication and socialization. And the symptoms vary widely from person to person. There's even an interesting condition called splinter skills, where it describes a situation where a person can be compromised in some areas and be extraordinarily gifted in others. Now, I find that pretty fascinating. But like most people, my husband and I focused on the negative. Um, but we were trying to get the best services for our son. And this turned into a full-time job for us. We were constantly going to appointments, conferences, evaluations. We were sending off all kinds of emails and letters and appeals. It felt like an unending job interview where the goal wasn't a job, but my son's life. And the stakes felt that high. Of course, we were dealing with lots of teachers, but we were also dealing with psychologists, speech therapists, occupational therapists. We even worked with a hippotherapist, which is a clinical term for a therapist who works with horses and horseback riding to engage people with disabilities. We were exhausted. We, just, we, we were just completely exhausted and overwhelmed. And it was still pretty painful, the feeling of being different, even less than, the subtle ostracism from other families and friends that we called polite indifference. But I think the biggest source of my pain is that we were working so hard to accomplish things we envisioned other people took for granted. For example, smiling. That can be very difficult for people on the spectrum. So while Zane was in school, every school year, the night before he had his school pictures, we would spend hours working with him. We would sit him in front of a mirror and coach him on how, he, how to make his smile authentic and genuine. We also worked with eye contact. For some reason, people on, with autism can find direct eye-to-eye -eye contact very uncomfortable or even painful. And I don't think most people realize how important a social skill that really is. I craved ordinary problems that I envisioned other families dealt with. But what we didn't realize, we were so busy chasing the ordinary that we missed that Zane had caught the extraordinary. And the hints were everywhere. He always loved music. When he was a baby, he would be in his car seat, and if a song came on, he would get so animated and excited. When he was 10 years old, 
he um, pleaded with us to play the, the trumpet in the school band. We thought that was nice, we thought it was cute, but silently, we were like, how's that gonna help with autism? But he did play in the band, and he actually played for seven years, and during that time, we noticed he could hear a jingle or a song off of the TV or radio and play it back perfectly. <clears throat> um, when he was, when Zane was a teenager, he started realizing that he was a little bit different, and as you can imagine, that wasn't great for his self-esteem. But during that time, he also developed his interest in the guitar. In fact, one day, he was playing Guitar Hero on his Xbox, and he turned away from it and told us definitively he wanted to play the real thing. Again, we thought that was nice, and he got that guitar on his next birthday, and we proceeded to ignore it. But Zane took that guitar up to his room and for two years taught him how to play. Now, of course, we were aware he was fiddling around with it, but we're focused on those evaluations and the schoolwork and everything else. What we didn't know, he also was putting his amp up in the window so the neighbors could hear. <laughs> and in fact, the neighbors were the ones who told us how good he was getting. So, <laughs> what we didn't realize at that time, that along with autism, residing within Zane was this desire to be heard, to be understood, and to connect. And music was that bridge. And we had no idea where that bridge was gonna take us. It led to the formation of his band, Blue Spectrum. That bridge also led us to the world famous Bill Street in Memphis, Tennessee. Zane, along with the keyboardist in his band, Blue Spectrum, they were chosen to represent the Columbus Blues Alliance in the Youth Showcase during the annual International Blues Challenge. And that bridge has also led us to this very stage tonight. Um, to tell you, I mean, there's been wonderful events, but the best part of it is the effect on Zane. He is so confident and enthusiastic now that he's operating in his gift. And I have to tell you, his smile is never more genuine or authentic as when he's playing that guitar. And also, another little tidbit, he can read. In fact, he loves to read about his favorite topic, music. He often goes to the library and checks out books about his favorite musicians, everyone from Beethoven to Jimi Hendrix. No kidding. So, but I got to tell you, a chill goes down my back every time I think about the very real possibility that we hadn't followed his passion. And, um, and the effect, and we don't know what that would have led to and a chill does definitely go down my spine, but it also made me realize the other unexpected gift, that we're not that different, we're not that far from other parents of typical children, because we all have to be careful to listen to our children and support their gifts. So I'm still grateful that Zane had the vision and the drive to push myself and my husband out of our pain and our tunnel vision, and that passion led to the motto for Blue Spectrum, which is, life is not to be viewed through the single diagnosis, but to be lived through the spectrum of potential, promise, and purpose. I love that quote. My husband actually wrote it. You may be f familiar with another quote, music can soothe the savage breast. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but it can certainly heal a broken heart. Thank you so much for listening. And now, ladies and gentlemen, my son, Zane Harshaw.